and having multiple languages on their website for the Commission for the Cons Conservation of Antarctic Marine Living Resources. Yes. Excellent. All right. Uh, welcome, Dane. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so I'll just give a quick introduction about myself before I go into it. Um, so I have been a developer in Drupal before. I now am more in the project management side of things, uh, working at Camelo, which is based just down the road here in Hobart. Um, and so, yeah, we'll be going through working with a multi-language infrastructure. So about Camilla. Um, Camilla, as um, you've just heard, is the Commission for the Conservation of Antarctic Marine Living Resources. Um, it was established in Canberra in 1982 by international treaty, um, which is why uh, we are actually based here in Australia. Um, Hobart being the optimal place because it's where Antarctic um, things happen. Um, the objective for the Commission is obviously to protect the Antarctic marine life, um, but allowing to provide the rational use um, so that we can still actually fish and, um, and use the resources. Um, as of this year, we're actually at 26 members. Um, we've gone up by one. The Netherlands actually joined us this year. Um, they used to be one of the signing countries, so that number has gone down to 10. Um, and these are the 26 members are the ones who make the decisions um, at our yearly meetings. Um, as I mentioned, our um, headquarters is actually located here in Hobart, literally up the road um, on Macquarie Street near the IBIS for anyone who's staying in that area. Um, and we operate in four languages. Um, and this comes from the fact that we're part of the Antarctic Treaty System and their languages are English, French, Russian and Spanish. And so therefore we also have to support English, French, Russian and Spanish. Um, we actually currently have multiple websites in operation and we're looking in the future of having um, even more websites in um, operation, um, but we'll get to that later. Just a quick um, information about the actual area that we, we look after. Um, so here's the map of our convention area. It's roughly 10% of the Earth's oceans that we actually um, look after. And so therefore, all the information we're presenting is about this ocean area. And as you can see on the map, um, it's also divided into areas and sub-areas, and we have to provide all the information for those areas. If you'd like to explore more about the areas, we do have a, a GIS site, which you can actually go to. You can play around with it. You can put different things on the map, like the EEZs in the area, and see where the MPAs are located as well. That site isn't in Drupal, I should add. Um, these are the main websites which we have. Um, that most, of the, so the top four are our Drupal sites. We have a couple of other Drupal sites, but they're quite minor. Um, and we have a couple of other websites which are not Drupal. The main sites that I'll be looking, at, I'll be talking about today, will be the main website, um, which is Camilla.org, and our meeting server, which is meetings.camilla.org. Um, those websites have full multilingual functionality. Um, whereas sites like Groups is done in English only because of the quick, the speed that people have to be able to communicate in it. Um, so we support that one in English. Um, and our ECDS, which I'll give a quick information about right now, is our catch documentation scheme. This is a scheme which is for the specifically the species of toothfish. Um, and this actual server um, has partial translation but what this server actually does is it allows us to keep track of all toothfish all around the world when they're caught um, and also when, where they're exported to um, and the process of it actually getting from, from ocean to the actual table. Um, and so that, this system actually allows us to know exactly how many toothfish are being caught. I'm not going to go into full depth about the modules, but this is just a brief um, list of the modules that are used to do translation on the websites. Um, so obviously we have the localization update um, to improve the local localization. Um, we have the multilingual 
um, international, internationalization, multilingual entity translation, and we have num numerous other extensions for, for these, as well as numerous custom um, built modules. So I said, I'm not going to go into full detail on these, um, but this is what we use to actually achieve our, our goals. The key goal for translation for our websites is that we should be able to have everything available in those four official languages. So about our main website. The current design of the main website was built in 2012 um, by the local development agency here, 80 Options, um, and they're still the um, organization that we use to, to develop the website. It was built in Drupal 7. Um, it contains a lot of functionality, and I'm not going to go into details of all the functionality, or we'd be here till next week. Um, but we do have currently in it over 40,000 nodes, and that is growing on a daily basis. Most of these nodes also have revisions. Um, and when we're dealing with translation, that means we have to keep translating all of those revisions. Now, Camilla has, um, internally, we have our own translation team. Um, we have two of each of the three languages that are not English. Um, and they do all the translation of all the content um, that is on the site. Um, and so what we're going to be going into next is how we work through doing that translation. This is an example um, of a translator page on the website. So I've just done the About Camilla page. Um, as you can see, so top left is English, top right is French, bottom left is Russian, and bottom right is Spanish. Um, and so as you can see, we have a complete translation of all of those. The menus is completely translated. The links, um, the quick links and related pages are completely translated. And this means that anyone who's on this site can travel around the website in their language and see all the content of language. We don't just have translations on the content as well, because one of the key things about this website is being the organization we are with the 26 members. Those 26 members actually all have users who are, mem who are actually registered on this site. And we'll get into that a little bit more later, but it means that we're not just translating the front end of the page that the public can see, but we're also translating functional back end items as well. To achieve this, we have a translation workflow that we work through to make sure that everything gets translated. It starts, obviously, when a page is created. This is just a standard page, the page about the convention area. As you can see, um, we have a standard title, a standard body. This then gets copied into a um, HTML file um, and saved into a directory where the translators can actually um, find the file so they can put it into their translation software, which helps to look for um, consistent phrases or consistent words to assist with their, their translating. Lovely tool that, that they can have. Um, but one of the key things that they do as a, as a translator is that they are actually checking everything to make sure that the English and the language that they translate it to is accurate um, and has the same meaning. The next step of the translation workflow is we have to actually then set up the content to actually be available for the translation. So for the example here, you can see that currently the Northern War, information for Northern Warrior um, page has not been set up to be translated to French, Russian, and Spanish. So what we would do is we would actually then add the translation um, for that language. And when we add that translation, we set its workflow, so it'll have in there a workflow status. We send that, set that to assign to translator. Um, that then allows it so that the translators can actually see that piece of work. Um, so, yeah. And this is then what the translators see. Um, and so I took this um, image this morning so that we would get a, a clear picture of what's currently in the translator's backlog for the website. Um, so 
The translators aren't just translating the website, so that's why we've got two of each. Right now, they're actually translating all the report text from the, from the meeting we had. Um, but this view here gives them an idea of all the things that they're translating for the, um, for the website. And as you can see in this view, um, what we have is we have so the Russian and the Spanish, so for example, with the conservation measures for 2019 um, slash 20 season. Um, this is a circular that's going to go out to the members only. Um, to tell them um, the current status of the conservation measures um, for the next season um, that's about to happen. Um, if I look at this list right now, I can see because the French isn't on the list, the French has been translated. The English, um, as part of our workflow, is put in there so that when we go to this list and all we see is the English one on here, we know that um, that has been completed with translation. Um, there is an example on here where we don't have the English showing and that's where we've got the schedule of conservation measures in force 2019 and 20. That's because the English is actually already published. It got published before the other languages and the other languages are being translated. So we have two slightly different approaches that happen for things. Circulars has one, documents has another. Um, but this view allows the translators to see specifically their translations. We also obviously have, when you're looking at a specific content type, the status of the specific um, translation. So looking again at that translate view um, that we looked at before, um, this shows that we have um, the English one published, and this is the one I was talking about before that um, the English wasn't showing in the list. So the English is already published. You can see that the French has been translated but not published. Um, what actually happens when the translators have finished translated translating it, is they actually put it into a pending approval status. Um, so it's still not published at that point, and that allows for another check to make sure that the actual translation is correct. Um, so I'm expecting that that French one will probably go live at some stage during today. Um, as I mentioned before, it's not just content that we have translated. Um, I'm not sure how easy this is to see on the screen, but if you, can, if you look at it, you'll be able to see that on the left, we have um, the English, and on the right, I have, I think it's the Spanish. Might be the French. I can't remember which one I grabbed. Um, so basically what we have is um, an example where we have majority of the, the back-end content translated, and this specific form here is actually um, part of our meeting document request. So for those who are members of the site, they can download this, the Antarctic Peninsula under a 1.5 degree global warming scenario document automatically. But for anyone who's not um, a member of the, of the commission, um, we have attached to the documents, you can see the list of documents, this form, um, and it's available in the, the four languages up until a point. So there are a few things which haven't actually been translated on this form. And it even passes down to user creation. And that comes because of the fact that the members actually create, so each member nation has um, allocated what we call party administrators. And those party administrators, they actually create the accounts for their members that they wish to be able to have access to the site. And so this form, um, I have on the left the English, and I have on the right the Russian. Um, and that means that you can see that what we have is the vast majority of that user creation form is translated into Russian, so that the Russian party admins um, can create a user in their own language. So that's, that was really um, the main website. Um, another one of our key servers is our meeting server. Now, this server, I'm 
have been corrected slightly on when it was when it was built. I believe the original meeting server itself, meeting functionality, was built in 2016. The current design was built in about 2018 for the site. It's also in Drupal 7 uh, at the moment, um, and it's used for multiple different meetings during the year. So in the meetings um, during the year, it's mostly used as an English-only server. Um, but it does have the translations in there for field names and those sorts of um, things for non-English speakers to be able to still get some translation. But during the two-week commission and scientific committee meetings, um, this website has everything translated into four languages within reason, <laughs> um, obviously because things are changing very quickly. We can't always get everything translated because of the small translation team. But um, the key thing about it is all documents will be in all languages. All final report text for adoption will be in all languages. Um, and that's done on the fly during, during the meeting. Uh, now this, this server, um, I'll go to this page here. Um, so this, this, is, this is what the meeting server looks like, um, which is, from the pictures which you've seen before, is vastly different to, to the main website at the moment. Um, you can see we have the translations down on the, the right for people, um, and this is a very simple setup of the meeting server at the moment. This is an example of the kind of translation which is happening on the, the meeting server. So these are what we call report text. Um, I can't show you more than what's on the screen there because these are actually confidential documents. So what I'm showing you here is the absolute maximum that I can show you of, of how this works. Um, but what happens is during the meetings we have what we are called um, rapporteurs, and they draft documents um, that has all the notes, all the minutes of the meeting. Um, and that document of the minutes of the meeting um, during the meeting itself will be uploaded to the meeting server through different versions uh, to actually, um, in, in English, because the rapporteurs will be doing it in English initially, and then when that document has been signed off by the chair of the meeting, it then goes to our translators who translate it and upload the translated version of that document to the meeting server. And this is the final result we get before we go into adopting the meeting. Um, now, I should also point out that this meeting is, is so important with language that we actually also have live interpretation at the meeting. Um, and that means that when you're listening on, everyone listens to with, um, with headphones and, or earphones if they want to wear earphones instead. Um, they, can, they will actually hear everything in their language, but the people who speak French, Spanish and Russian can speak their own language and it will get translated to English or vice versa. The English will get translated to them or the Spanish will get translated to English and then to French and Russian um, and just a large combination of languages happening during these meetings. Um, and this server helps to support all that. So this is an example of um, the report text um, uploading or uploading of a new version of report text. So as you can see, this is um, uh, for agenda item three um, of the report. Um, and what it has, as you can see, is it actually has four versions um, in it at this point in time. Um, and they're all visible to anyone who has access to the meeting server. Uh, this, as you can see, we have translation for the vast majority of the form. Um, obviously, you can see status, the status title name, um, the version number are not, um, but the vast majority of the rest of this form is actually translated. And as I said earlier on, one of the key goals of, of us is to have as much of the sites actually translated to these four languages as we possibly can. So there's, and there's always room for us to do 
improvement um, on these, these items. And I've also attached the, so that first page was English and, and French, and this is the Russian and the Spanish versions of the, of the same form. So you can see the same thing. Everything for all the languages is translated, um, with the exception of a few of the titles at the moment. So what does the future look like for this infrastructure? Um, basically, we're always looking to constantly improve the translation um, and, and eliminate any oddities that, that are happening. Um, for example, as, as we saw on some of those um, forms, some of the things that are not translated. Um, we're currently in the very early stages of a two-year project that will upgrade all our sites to Drupal 8, um, working with 80 options on delivering that. Um, as well as separating out the functional parts of the sites into actual separate sites. Um, that's mainly for our main website, which has a large amount of functionality in it. Um, not all of it is actually related to the other parts of the website. Um, we're also looking to have a new design for the entire web infrastructure developed by 2021. Um, and as I mentioned, we're in the early stages at the moment, and the first phase of this delivery is we're delivering a new purpose-built authentication server in Drupal 8. And I know that there'll be people who potentially wonder why are we building an authentication system in Drupal 8? Well, one of the key things is that um, the translation. Um, there's not a lot of authentication tools out there which can actually operate in the four languages the way we need it to operate. And so therefore, we actually got AD Options building us a authentication um, in Drupal, Drupal 8. And I've wrapped up pretty early, but does anyone have any questions? Hi, I'm just wondering how much, if any, you rely on automatic translation systems? Um, that's actually a very good question. Um, we, obviously with some of the functionality, with some of the, the titles of the forms and fields and things like that, there is some automated translation. Um, the philosophy that I I'm going to go be going forward with most of it is to limit the automated translation in terms of using um, other people's translations. Um, the idea is we will use automated translation in terms of being able to have words and phrases, but it needs to be our own dictionary um, because, and this is one of the key things which the translators have actually told me uh, um, in the last couple of months, is they're not happy with some of the, the translations that have happened through the localization, for example. Um, they, the problem is, is that some of those translations don't have the context of where that item actually is. And so therefore, the translation is technically correct, but it's not right for that context. Um, and so there will be a bit of a balance of automating that stuff so that we don't have to get the translators to translate everything, but also allowing the translators to make those calls on what words should actually be used. Um, so I, does that answer your question? Um, you mentioned uh, using various custom-built modules yep. to assist with the translation. Um, I just you want to know what kind of um, customizations you did there, and what, why, and why you needed it, and what purpose um, they served. Um, that's <laughs> that's a harder one for me to answer because obviously I haven't been involved. But maybe um, Tony from AD Options would be able to help out with that one. Um, so, from memory, because the, the site was sort of launched when Drupal 7 was uh, pretty new, um, and at that time the entity translation module didn't exist yet. Uh, so, the very first instance was all uh, node-based translation. So, when you add a translation, you're adding an extra node. Um, and then Drupal 7 matured, the ent entity translation module came on, and then you could have translations within the same 
the same node. Um, so there's some custom work that had to be done to make sure that the translators had a common workflow um, despite there being those two approaches because of how Drupal 7 sort of developed over the, the life cycle of the site. Yeah, so it was mostly around trying to make the process easy for the translators so they would have a, a sort of an easy to-do list. These are the pages that needed translations updated. Anyone else? Yes? I'd like to hear about uh, the process of migrating to Drupal 8. So are you like up updating only the core and that's it? Or are you migrating all the content in a new, <laughs> newly created site? Yeah, um, that's probably a very good question actually. So we as um, the commission, we have to keep everything that we have. So for us to go to Drupal 8, all the data which is currently in the websites is going to have to be migrated to the Drupal 8 version. And I'm not, um, I guess I should say, what's the right words for it? I'm, I feel sorry for 80 options because they're going to have to deal with that migration. Um, and, um, but we're also going to have to deal with making sure that that migration goes and everything is actually over onto the new system. Um, one of the things which we do have as well, um, which I can possibly show, is we, because of that requirement, we actually do have our previous site still available online. Um, you just have to know where it is to find it. Um, and that means that we have kept all our information from our previous sites as well, um, which will probably be, probably be what happens with this site as well. It'll probably still exist in some form. Um, it'll just be shuffled off to the side somewhere, so that if, if we ever find that something's missing, we can go back to it and get it into the, into the new site. But yeah, the main aim would be to get 100% over if we can. The, the process of migrating the translation to translated content um, isn't that... Um, problematic, I don't think, in most cases, except that the, the early iteration of the site was using that node-based translation. Um, and because it's developed so that we still have some translations that are in different nodes and the rest are in entities, that, that'll be one complication with the migration process that we'll have to overcome. But, um, but for any other site that, that you might have that you're going through the same process, if you were lucky enough to jump on Drupal 7 when entity translation was the norm, um, then I, I don't think the migration to Drupal 8's translation method would be um, too problematic. Last chance? No? All right. Well, let's thank Dane. Mm -hmm.